right now we are in northern Iraq. We're only about 30 miles in that direction from ISIS, from where ISIS is at. When you see the refugees that are leaving from the danger that's happening just over here, where do they go? Where do the refugees lead to? Yup, that's me on the border of ISIS territory. You may not know it, but this was the first part of the world that saw great revival. This is the land of Abraham, where Jonah saw the greatest recorded Old Testament revival. And this became the missions base of the apostles Thomas and Jude. Why is it now a land of war and despair? Muslims have been fleeing in great number. And where are they going to? Seems like we're not the only ones taking a road trip to look for revival. Muslims are risking their lives each and every day to reach the Christian nations of the world. And we just so happen to stumble across them. Today, we were driving and our GPS took us to the wrong village. The village is the westernmost point of Turkey. We haven't seen anybody or cars for, for miles. Here comes a car. And as we were driving, we came across this village where we saw abandoned houses, these areas right out in the middle of the forest. There's big piles of brand new, I mean, these are, these are brand new life jackets. I can, you can hear some people back in there. Somebody's back there. Why are those things here in the middle of nowhere? Then we realized this is a part of the route for those that are trying to escape ISIS from Syria and Iraq and make their way to Europe. My name? is Eugene Bach, and I host the Back to Jerusalem podcast. I live out of my backpack, and my office, yeah, it's an economy airplane seat. Why do I travel around the world? Well, you could say I have a sort of disease, but I can't sit still when I live in the space between all the bad news and the good news. I may be just another random guy with a podcast, but what I am seeing in history and around the world today tells me that our God is not just another God. And I'm not saved just to be a part of another church program. I believe God has given us a mission, but often we can't fit it into our schedule or find a place left on our to-do list. Many of us are left standing in the space between the great commission and the not so great reality of the church in the world today. Now, I have a hunch that we already know the answers, but why does much of the church seem stale? Why are so many prayers powerless? Who wants a bigger vision? Who wants a taste of God's amazing promises? When the rubber hits the road, I have a hunch that revival is what I need. And likely, I'm not the only one. Now, I haven't heard of any war refugees wanting to make it to Mecca, but many of them do set their sights on Rome, as did the Apostle Paul. Next stop, the Mecca of early revival, Rome. Rome opens up a huge number of questions for me. You have the Pope here, you have church history with all these ceremonies and practices, but I'm not familiar with any of that stuff. It seems so foreign to me. And sometimes, Things that are foreign also seem wrong. I'm going to be meeting with uh, Danny. Uh, he's a pastor from the UK. And uh, he's going to be able to hopefully help with a lot of understanding some of these, these things that took place in history. Being in a place that has so much rich history, not just for this area, not yeah. just for yeah. Italy, but yeah. for Europe in general. You're talking over 2,000 years later, and so the very society of much of our society within the uh, within England stems from right where we're sitting at. It'd be nice if there was like a map. I know, or even just yeah, just a layout like you get at the mall. What, what it was where we were. <laughs> <the mall. laughs> Most of what we see here in the Roman culture was greatly influenced by the Greek culture. One of the things that they shared was polytheism. I mean, there were gods everywhere. You yes. had a god for everything. Yes. So what made Christianity different? Why not just another god, just another religion? We can get a glimpse of that 
in the 21st century. Yeah. I mean, people like to think there's loads of roads like all roads to Rome. No man comes to the Father but by me. So Jesus was making it very clear. Look, there's only one way. Now, just to let you know, I'm thrilled there's at least one way because <laughs> we didn't even deserve one way. So when you walk into the prison where they kept Peter, it was basically a dungeon with a hole in the floor. So when they would have brought Paul and Peter in, they would have lowered them down into that hole. So there were two separate chambers. Right. There was an upper chamber and then a lower. In his letters, you notice there's a real confidence that he's gonna be released. Maybe he just knew, maybe the Lord told him, but, or maybe it's just an inner confidence that it's not, it's not the end yet. So then he was released. But in 2 Timothy, it's no. You know, him in chains, it's a cold cell as well. There's no confidence that he's gonna be let out. My time's up, I'm gonna be poured out as a, like a drink offering. You write a letter mm -hmm. and pretend it is your last mm -hmm. letter. It's very good. What would you write? Yeah, what's within you that, that would come out? So I think it adds to the value of Paul's writings it, it is these type of epistles. Because he knew, especially through T. Timothy, that it's about to end. It's either when there's a need or when there's persecution or their backs against the wall. Suddenly, prayer doesn't become the last resort, suddenly becomes the first resort. For the Christians here in Rome, it was a first resort because of what was going on, especially under Nero. A lot of the church suffered in there. Even though it's a beautiful building, it has a really ugly history. There are many, many Christians who lost their lives here in, in, in a brutal way. If the cross is an icon of suffering of Jesus Christ, this was an icon for the suffering of Christians that followed after him. This is a symbol that it may seem romantic, yes. but yes. It, you know, yes. what kind of romanticism do you have in anguish and death? Yeah. Rome became a Christian nation and they found it to be unethical and disgusting to have people fighting and killing each other. What good is a major coliseum where yeah, people want yeah. to come for entertainment if there's no death and blood? And you Christians are ruining our fun. Society started to change and, um, and they put value on things, but this, the influence was from the church. This place stands empty, I think, because Christians- I think so. Messed up the agenda. We become very popular as well. <laughs> yeah, this was a nice place to stand. <laughs> Just a short walk from the Colosseum, we find an early underground church where those experiencing revival would meet secretly at daybreak. Danny reads a written letter by a Roman official who discovered their meeting place. The Christians are accustomed to meet at daybreak and to recite or sing a hymn to Christ as to a God and to abstain from theft and robbery and adultery and breach of faith. And after this, they depart and meet again to take food. And to find out the truth concerning them, I applied torture to two maidservants who were called deaconesses in their, what they call the church. The name for the church is Ecclesia, which means the gathering of people. The culture's all different, but it's an unbroken chain. And, and the practices, according to God's word, have been unbroken for over 2000 years. You know, being here in the underground church, yeah. uh, where the where Christians re really began to grow yes. uh, here in Rome is great. Okay, here we have to make a transition from the persecuted underground believers to the politician turned Christian. It can be argued whether revival resulted or stopped at this point, but it nevertheless impacted the entire world. And who was the man who took the church from the underground and made it official? Constantine. The, the taxi driver didn't even know how to get here. I didn't see anything here with Constantine. Yeah, probably the most significant battle, if not for Rome, all of Europe. Anybody that wanted to go into Rome, they would go through this. So with this Constantine, area. this was a, quite a landmark. Because what happened here, you had two armies with two potential emperors. Whoever's going to leave here, this bridge, 
they would be emperor. So these two meet and at night he has a vision of a cross. So in his vision he hears the audible words with this symbol, you shall conquer. And it's the symbol of the cross. He's not a Christian. Not that, that's he, right. Yeah, he, no, he's not good, a Christian. So he goes through his troops and tells his troops, put the signature of the cross on your shields, on our banner. That was from a vision. How does he know he just didn't have bad chili the night before? Uh -huh. It had to be something significant right. for him to change his life forever uh -huh. from right. the night that he arrived on the other side of this bridge. Yeah. And that impacted Christianity. From here, right, right, really from this bridge, then it throughout Rome, and then throughout the empire, throughout Europe, and then Africa and America, and, and that's how it just swept through. Within 15 years, he brings all the world church leaders together that were once persecuted, now that it's open, and solidifies what it is that the Christians believe. But that all comes as the result of a military battle, a military conquest. I see those that gave their lives. They didn't resist, they didn't fight back, they actually gave their lives and they were martyred. Yeah. And then on the other side, I see yeah. Constantine, who was a military leader, yeah. who was a statesman, who was the emperor of the most powerful empire in the world. How is that different? Yeah. What Constantine did with the cross on his banner, on the shields of his soldier, than what we see with like ISIS or Islamic troops that are doing uh, religious conquests that's something that many people will be asking themselves you know what is the difference and I think that in order to really see the heart of state religion in Rome we have to go to the tourist place yeah. of the Vatican in order to get there we have to um, take the public transportation and this is um, this is one of the best ways actually for us to get from the area and there, Pastor Danny was getting his wallet stolen. And that took us on a slight detour. We've gotten corrected and stopped by the police for filming. You have to leave now. But no police officers can take a report for a stolen wallet. One set of police officers, they sent us to another train station. They sent us to another police office. They told us they're closed until six o'clock. I think they're playing Minecraft. So we are thinking about filing a report with uh, the uh, barber shop. There, we might actually get a haircut. So here we are in St. Peter's Square. This is pretty cool. Revival grew under persecution. And now we have done the transition from persecution to not just freedom, but actually enforcement of Christianity, which was healthier. Where I come from in my part of the world, I certainly grew up in a a school system and really with the state that was very much influenced by the church. It was a, an identity. We didn't see a separation. The church here has a great influence, massive influence on the state. For good, uh, for bad. Can I share with you my challenge? Yeah. I can identify with those that want to reject such a powerful uh, force on their life like that would come from the Pope. It's almost like growing up in a house where you see your parents do something that you say, you know what, I'm never gonna do that when I grow up. The first 300 years before Constantine, when the church was being tortured in the most horrendous ways, and I'm like, okay, how do we balance this safety and freedom, this church and state? Because a state that follows after God is so much more blessed but it's still run by man, right? Yeah. So there's got that corruption of man yeah. at the top. There is that balance somehow, somewhere. We're passing through. We belong actually in, in a citizenship, in, in another world, in another nation, that, that actually, that's where our passport lies. That is when the, the complete kingdom of when you have, there's no separation. In fact, you know, there's no condemnation or yeah. separation. Yeah. Um, but until we get to there, but is there an answer to this? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I love that. Trying to find the perfect balance between freedom and state religion may not really be there because we were never meant to be ruled by man. But we will one day in yes. the kingdom have a ruler. Absolutely. That there will be no division between church and state. He will rule in perfection. Yes. Yeah, that's, I think that's as close to an answer that we'll find. Here in Rome, the Christians changed the idea of ethics. 
This is Justin Martyr. He's a noted early Christian and he wrote to Emperor Pius. Before, we hated one another and killed one another and would not eat with those of another race. But now, since the manifestation of Christ, we have come to a common life and pray for our enemies and try to win over those who hate us without cause. That's transformation. Isn't it? It's transformation. I mean, this, this is before, you know, human rights. The gospel was being preached and understood in probably at least 30 languages, maybe more, maybe 100 languages. So was that an amazing accomplishment? A 7,000 mile long church built with about 30 million Christians in thousands of churches. They began to feel complacent about what had been accomplished. If the Roman Empire acknowledges Christianity, the Roman Empire is the most important part of the earth, people will begin to come from everywhere to trade in the Roman Empire, and they'll pick up the gospel and take it home with them. We don't need to send our sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters out on dangerous missions where they might never come back. So with the end of the persecution, they came thronging into the churches, but they weren't born again. They were nominal Christians, cultural Christians. They invented the creeds, and I explained how the creeds were so important. They were like pocket New Testaments because the printing press would not exist for another seven or 800 years and Christians memorize the creeds. But the Great Commission is left out. The creed says on the third day Jesus rose again from the dead and then it jumps straight to the, the ascension. And so church fathers were beginning to teach Christians Jesus actually gave the Great Commission only to the apostles and not to the church. It's been accomplished to the, the, God's satisfaction through the apostles and their immediate descendants. It's not on our shoulders anymore. So the Great Commission begins in Genesis 12 and is reaffirmed four more times in Genesis alone. He said, your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. So you're going to spread out and God said, off are to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring, not as you cloister in one, in one part of the earth, but as I spread you out everywhere. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. Then he commissioned his church, beginning with the apostles, to proclaim repentance and, to, and forgiveness of sins to all peoples on earth. After that, he ascended into heaven. We end up following the gospel, leaving Asia Minor, going to Europe. But something interesting happens in Rome uh, in the fourth century, and that is uh, the conversion of Constantine and Constantine making Christianity a state religion. And this is the first time that we see persecution kind of stop, at least momentarily, for Christianity. Constantine makes his empire focus on this area here, on the very eastern part of Europe, right on the border of Asia, Constantinople. And an empire is formed here from the fourth century uh, that will reign for a thousand years. And this is like a golden period for Christianity. Christianity is booming, trade is booming, science, education, all of these things are booming all throughout this area of Constantinople, which is where we're driving right now is present day Istanbul. That was all going to change because in the seventh century, there was a man who rose up in the Middle East in Arabia, Muhammad. In the background, you can hear the Muslim call to prayer. That would have been much different more than a thousand years ago when we had Christianity was the main uh, religion and faith throughout this entire area. But this empire here, based in Constantinople, was the crown gem. The Muslims were coming, and they were determined to take over this city of Constantinople. While exploring the city, I bumped into one of the most well-known Muslim historians of our day. What's your name? Uh, Felix. 
He is actually a Chinese from Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim country in the world. He's written books about the Muslim conquest over Constantinople, which was the center of the Christian world in that day. To, to our Muslims, the yeah. city is very important because the Prophet Muhammad has said uh, when he was alive, verily Constantinople shall be conquered and the conqueror will be the best leader and his ma army will be the best army. So uh, many times the Muslims are uh, struggling to get uh, the city. So Mehmet has made a, a great uh, entering the city from that place. Uh, he came here inspired by, uh, by the Prophet about uh, 50,000 people in the city because uh, the other is fleeing from the city. How many soldiers were in his army? Uh, uh, 250,000. 250,000 yeah. and he was only 21. 21. You might be asking yourself, why would the Muslims have come to attack this city? Felix explains that the Muslims simply believed it was theirs because it was taught in the Hadith. What teachings were those? It's by Rasulullah, by the Prophet Muhammad. He yeah. said that Constantinople, fairly Constantinople will be conquered. Mm -hmm. Okay, very uh, The Rasulullah hasn't come here and the uh, Sahaba hasn't come here, but they believe in what every uh, Prophet said. Okay. But the Prophet and the Christianity is very, very, very close. A Christian people, he said that when you embrace Islam, uh, then you will get two rewards. They was from believing in Isa alayhi salam, when believing in Jesus and believing in Muhammad. Mm. But uh, in, you, in Jews, the Jews is keep uh, battling uh, Muslims and keep battling uh, Christians too. I was former a Catholic and I convert to Islam. Okay. You yeah. Did. yeah when, so, when, when did that happen? Uh, about uh, 13 years ago. 13 years ago? Yeah. And what, what led to that? Do you mind if I ask? Yeah, no, yeah. I don't mind. Because uh, in my opinion that Islam is according to my thinking. When, when I'm in Catholic, I'm sorry, but uh, when I'm thinking, uh, the religion don't, uh, doesn't match. Mm. So in Islam, the thinking is matching with the religion. So when I'm thinking, the religion gives me space for, to thinking, the space to express my thinking, and it's all according to my thinking. Okay. Yeah. And when you pray, um, do you also pray in Arabic or in your own language? In, in Islam, every, everyone pray if Salat in Arabic, but in normal praying, when we ask Allah for something, we do it in our language. Wow, that was a lot of stuff that we didn't yeah. know. Thank you so much. You're yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. It was fascinating you, talking to Felix. He's an interesting young man. Because he's not what most people would expect for one who travels the world teaching about the benefits of Jihad. He's friendly, he's very well spoken, and on Facebook and it has nearly 4 million followers. After exploring uh, Istanbul today and seeing the Christian history, there are questions that come to mind. Is Islam a peaceful religion? Today, we were not that far from a bombing that took place in Istanbul. There was a suicide bomber that blew himself up in the main town square. I've read through the Quran several times. I was taught Islam by an Imam. I so wanted to come to the, the conclusion that Islam is indeed a peaceful religion and can be used for a bridge to Jesus Christ. Who founded Islam? Muhammad did lead a very violent life. Whether it was right or not is another debate. But to say that Muhammad was a peaceful individual is not being honest. It is not being truthful. When I look at the Quran, and there's over a hundred different surahs that directly relate to jihad, war for religion, to eradicate the infidel. Was it established like Christianity, where Christians gave their lives so that people would believe? Did they come in by force? guns or swords and force those that they were able to conquer to accept Allah and Muhammad as his prophet. When we look at Islam, there's actually only one way to guarantee salvation. Even Muhammad himself had said he doesn't know if he'll make it into heaven. Because there's only one way, and that one way is martyrdom through jihad. That is how you can secure your place in eternity in a place like this, when looking at the challenges that we face today, is Islam a peaceful religion?
we started off by asking what makes Rome different than Mecca. Well, Rome holds the record of the message that Peter and Paul gave their lives for, to bring the gospel of peace. Mecca, by contrast, has a legacy of conversion or death. What is the main difference between Rome and Mecca? Rome had revival and Mecca is still waiting. Emperor, who was it? I've forgotten who it was. We just uh, talked about it. Yes, we did. So really? they chose here. Yeah. Why? Why? Why did they choose? You're you the think? One that told me. <laughs> well, I know, but <laughs> they make great TV. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs>